Hey everyone, if you've been following us on Instagram about our Cornelius job, this is it. When we got the blueprints, we initially looked at them and thought it would be a certain budget number. When we came to the site and we found out that we had to move the pool pumps, the electric ran under the garage, we had to have Duke Power relocate the service lines, the gas line went under the garage. There was a tremendous amount of infrastructure that had to go into this job that you're not actually gonna see on the back end. So you've always got to consider the infrastructure when you're looking at a blueprint. This is our Cornelius Lake House job. We're doing a two-story garage and a pool house on the back. There'll be a sauna inside. It's going to be really cool. You should follow us for those updates. But today we had to put up batter boards. That's going to be where the edge of our wall is. They're going to come in next week, excavate, put in footers. That way everything's nice and square. So when we got the blueprint and got on site, we found out that we had to change a lot of infrastructure that was already in place. You could see that they're hooking up the gas line to the pool equipment. The pool equipment was actually in the footprint of the building. So that's one of the things we had to calculate in the building of this pool house. So when we laid out our building and we had everything surveyed, we found out that the service wire from Duke Power was actually traveling underneath the driveway and then going under our garage footprint. So we had to have Duke Power come out and actually relocate that line around our building, which has taken a tremendous amount of time and delayed this project quite a bit. So you get a blueprint and you do an estimate based on that blueprint and then you get to the site and you find out that the site's not ready for the blueprint that's drawn. In this case we actually found out that we had to go down six feet in order to get buildable ground. So we also had to tier our footers because of the natural grade. Now you'll never see any of this but it's something you've got to be aware of when you're looking at a blueprint. Building in winter in North Carolina always presents interesting dilemmas. When we started excavating for the footers here in Cornelius, we actually found that we had to dig down six feet to get to dirt that we could actually build on. We actually had to excavate and then put some soft concrete in there so it would flow out. Everything's back on schedule now. So today we're here in Cornelius again. Uh, last week we told you about the footers. They had to excavate over six feet in order to get down to good ground so they could put footers in. Uh, today they're putting the foundation block walls in. Later on we're going to go ahead and uh, put the waterproofing in against those and the foundation drain. Next week we've got plumbing coming up. We'll get the rough end done and then we can pour the slab, get some framing done. Back in Cornelius at our garage slash pool house. Uh, we got here at 7.30. It was very cold. Set up and the concrete trucks arrived at 8 a.m. They finished about 10. It was a real fast process. It went very smooth. Uh, next up, they're going to let it harden a little bit. They're going to take the automated trowel and they're going to slick finish. They're going to make everything really smooth and nice so we can put epoxy on top of it. So after that, we'll go through with a concrete saw and do controlled cuts. That way we control where the concrete will break instead of just letting it break naturally. I wanted to do live videos today, but that really wasn't an option with all the compressor noise that we had. So I gave you one at the very beginning. You saw that. This is a, my favorite day uh, in construction because it's the biggest show. Everybody gets to see what is going to take shape. This is a two-story garage. We're going to frame it in three days. The homeowner's happy. We're happy. And we're ready to finish the project at this point. As you were watching, there were these big bolts that they ran the wood through. Those bolts actually hold the structure to the concrete and that keeps the wind from lifting the building away. In a hurricane type situation, that's definitely something you have to consider and something you want to do for sure. We did all the framing on the ground, which allows us to get everything the same length. It's easier to work with that way. Then you get four or five guys, you lift the whole wall up, bolt it to the ground, brace it, and you can move on to the next wall. When you saw them putting those giant beams across, those are called LVLs. LVLs allow us to have open expanses. When people say, can you take a load-bearing wall out, that's how we do it. We expand that load across the frame down to the footers, transferring anything above it down to the footers. 
So if you look behind me, they're nailing a bunch of two by four braces across all the framing. And what they're doing is they're leveling it and plumbing it. That way, when they put the joists across the top, everything is square, level, and plumb. So this is a standard drywall finish here in North Carolina. It's called a level four finish. And what that means is basically you can stand six feet away and look at the wall and not see any imperfections. You get closer, you might see imperfections. However, as you're finishing, you still have to use some kind of light source. And as the light changes throughout the day, you'll notice that there are imperfections that can be seen. And when you get paint on it and the light changes, you're gonna see those imperfections. So you still have to go that extra step with your flashlight or a light to make sure that you don't see that. There's two types of drywall you're going to run into. The white drywall that you see everywhere in a standard application, and then there's a mold resistant drywall. Sometimes it's blue, sometimes it's green, there's different colors, but it all serves the same application. As the water penetrates in and out of this drywall, you want to make sure that you mitigate any possible damage if there is a leak, and this type of drywall will help out with that. So right now we're standing in a heated, cooled storage area. Below us is an unfinished garage. This stairway leads to an unfinished garage. On the blueprints, there was no call for a window here. It was just a wall. When the homeowner saw that they were basically cutting off this beautiful view to the lake, they decided they wanted to put a window in, but there were certain limitations legally that we could do. Since this is attached to a garage where a car could be running, and then this is a heated and cooled space, this window has to be inoperable, which means it has to be completely fixed. You cannot open it. That way no carbon monoxide can leak into this heated and cooled space. When we went over this blueprint, the architect called out a mini split system for the bathroom. The bathroom's only about 64 square feet. It's very small. My HVAC tech told me that the smallest unit they make is actually too big for that space. It's just gonna freeze over trying to cool that space. So we had to get creative. There was a unheated attic area that we decided to finish and heat and cool, which allows us to balance that small space with this big space and create one cohesive usable bathroom that's not gonna to be too cold to use. This is what's considered a non-living space. There should be nobody sleeping up here. But in the eyes of the inspector, there's a staircase leading up to this space, so theoretically someone could be sleeping up here. Given that, we're required to provide two forms of egress. We've got a 32-inch minimum door opening, and we have to provide a window that's 5.7 square feet. This house has their standard up and down windows. Well, you can't get 5.7 square feet out of one of those windows that is a double like this at this distance. So we had to go with what's called a casement window to get that 5.7 square feet. These windows crank out all the way that way. If a fire and rescue team needs to come up here, they can do that. When it rains, the water used to hit this ground and travel straight out to the lake, but we put a big building in front of it, blocking that path of travel for the water. So we had to put great drains in front of the garage that tie into a drainage box, tie into a 12 inch line that runs around the building and back out to the lake. When you're doing an estimate, you gotta remember there's federal building codes, state building codes, county building codes, and city building codes, all of which can be more stringent. We've done about 12 showers in Forsyth County, all of which had hot water, all of which pumped out onto the ground. In Mecklenburg County, which is Charlotte, they require you to pipe the water back into the sewer line and put a roof on it. So they don't want any rainwater going into the sewer and they don't want any hot water going out into the lake. So you really wanna pay attention to where you're building because the codes could be very different and cost you money in the long run if you don't plan for it. You wanna think about contingencies when you're doing a building budget. On the blueprint, this only had two steps. But once we put a building here and the final grade was in, we found out we needed five steps. So the contingency is gonna save us on that one. So with board and batten siding, you've gotta really plan out your layout. If you look at this window up here, it was really imperative that we started from the center and went out. Because if we went from left to right with the framing, the window would look off even though it's not. In this element, we've got a door and we've got a light and then we've got all these batten strips to lay out. 
and you're going to lose something in that process. You're not going to be able to center everything. So we had to choose the light. The wall is going to be white, which will blend most of the elements together. The light's going to be black, so that's going to draw your focus. So we really put our energy into centering that light. On the original blueprint to this garage, there was no window here. Well, as we built it, the homeowners saw that we were cutting off the view to the lake. And in order to give them that view to the lake and put a window here, we had to follow some building codes. There's a garage below us which could leak carbon monoxide into this heated and cooled space. So this window actually has to be inoperable, which means you can't open it or close it and is sure to keep the carbon monoxide out of this space. Technically, this is a conditioned storage space above a garage. Nobody should be sleeping up here, but because there is a stairwell leading up to it, there's the chance that somebody might be sleeping up here, especially since it's heated and cooled. So we had to follow egress codes. The door has to be a 20 minute rated fire door, 32 inches wide, and we have to have an egress window, which is required to be no more than 44 inches off the ground and 5.7 square feet. So when it opens, you could get somebody out in case there was a fire. This garage is actually built with a mini pool house on the back. It comes with a sauna and a half bathroom. The architect called for that space to be heated and cooled using a wall hung mini split. The problem is the smallest wall hung mini split is going to freeze over because the space is too small. We had to get creative and take the unconditioned space above the garage and condition it in conjunction with the bathroom. Those two spaces will now balance each other out using a bigger ducted mini split. There's certain applications for certain building materials, in my opinion, that are better than others. When you're dealing with crown molding, MDF is a great product because it doesn't contract and expand as summer transitions to winter, whereas wood is going to do that. When it comes to a door casing or baseboards, I really prefer a real wood product just for durability. If this is MDF and you hit it, it's very hard to repair and it kind of crumbles. Whereas if it's wood, it's going to take a harder hit and you're going to be able to repair it a little easier. Building trends are cyclical. Things are cool, then they become dated, and then about 30 years, they become cool again. One of the things that is a modern trend, but I believe is timeless, is letting the wood be the wood. Instead of staining it, just clear coat it. Pick the species of the wood that you like, put a clear polyurethane on it, and let it represent what the product is, as opposed to changing it with a stain. Hand railing code says that you've got to be between 38 and 34 inches. We like to put them at 36. That's pretty standard. It's a comfortable height. Now, since this landing is attached to staircases, we have to keep a continuous hand railing going completely up the staircase. That way you've got a continuous place to grab. Just like every element of building, garages have a certain building code that you have to follow. This breezeway wasn't here, so that's an exterior door leading into their kitchen. But because we attached it to the garage, we're required to put up a 20 minute rated fire door. And if you look here, this ensures that it is indeed a 20 minute rated fire door. And that's going to satisfy the inspector and also let the homeowner know that we've done things properly. As a builder, we really care about our details. And if we can go the extra mile, we will. Traditionally in a garage, you're going to end up with an exposed metal track. We like to powder coat it. It gives it a nice, sleek, high-end finish, and it doesn't cost a whole lot more. One of my favorite things about working with my partners over at Sunnyside Millworks is brainstorming storage solutions for what would be traditionally a dead space in a job. There's not a lot of room right here in this breezeway, but they needed a storage solution. So what we came up with was a shoe drop that is actually recessed inside the wall, utilizing that space as well as the space outside the wall to get the depth that we need. There've been a lot of really cool innovations over the years in exterior building products. Traditionally, this corbel would have been carved out of a big piece of wood and required a lot of maintenance to ensure that it didn't rot. Well, since we started using PVC, PVC is never going to rot. It doesn't require nearly as much maintenance and it'll be there as long as the structure's there. No matter how much you think you're prepared to start a job, you're going to end up with a few surprises along the way. 
The architect called out two stairs here. Well, once we had the building up and the grade established, we realized that two stairs wasn't enough. It was actually gonna take five steps down. So even if you're prepared, you're gonna end up with a few surprises along the way. You just have to learn to adapt. Cedar is a beautiful product, but you need to be aware that cedar is a high maintenance product. If you leave this outside unprotected, it's going to gray out, which it will turn different shades of gray. You will need to seal cedar outside about every year to maintain its natural color. Creative Storage Solutions is something that we really pride ourselves upon. This is a very small half bath inside of a pool house with no storage. Well, we took the dead space behind the stairs and put a drawer bank in it so they can put their pool towels in it. In an otherwise dead space, there's your creative storage solution. This wood feature goes by the name of shiplap or nickel gap. They called it nickel gap because the gap between the two pieces of wood would fit a nickel. Well, there's a couple different brands you can buy. One overlaps and you have to face nail it. This one actually interlocks with a tongue and groove, so your finished wall is completely smooth and there's no nail holes to fill.